you may now begin. Okay, Natalia, you got this. First question. Yeah. Yeah, this totally makes sense. Uh, okay, never mind. You know who always knows? Spencer. He always knows. What if I just jump to the back? You study, just start. Time's up. No. So I can't be the only one who sometimes freaks out during an exam. If that's you, don't worry, you are not alone. Today we're gonna go over some common topics for physics. Specifically a pulley example, since this seems to be a popular exam question. We'll review it from a conceptual perspective. This is our example. The given states, there is a negligible friction between block A and the tabletop. Block B hangs from a string that runs over a pulley and is attached to block A. The pulley has negligible mass and friction about its axle. Blocks A and B's mass is MA and MB. Now let's say that the blocks are released from rest. Release from rest indicates that the initial variables, such as velocity, are zero. Question A states, suppose the mass of block A, or MA, is much greater than the mass of block B. Estimate the magnitude of the acceleration of the blocks after release. Before trying to solve this problem, let's highlight a few things. First, we are being asked to find the magnitude, which is a value. So we're going to want to quantify our answer. Secondly, we are given that MA's mass is much greater than MB. Personally, I'm a visual learner. So when I was taking this class, I tried to come up with some crazy ideas to help me. For example, the first thing that came to my mind was using a panda and a puppy to show that block A has a greater mass than block B. Without thinking of formulas or numbers and just using this panda and puppy scenario, what could we say about acceleration? There is still a net force on puppy, but due to the panda's large mass, the magnitude of acceleration is so small that it's pretty close to zero. If this is still confusing, don't worry. We will end up providing a proof shortly. Also, remember that acceleration is force over mass. So the larger the mass in the denominator is getting, the smaller the fraction will be. Okay, so question B switches it up a bit. It's asking for the magnitude of acceleration when the block A mass, so MA, is much less than MB. So basically, we're switching panda and puppy now. Although it might be tempting to say, since the panda will end up speeding up this whole process, acceleration is growing enormously, let's take a look at this again. Since block A, or the puppy, has a super small mass, we can say that it's pretty close to zero. Therefore, block B, or the panda, is almost like free falling. And as we know, hopefully, the acceleration of an object in free fall is 9.8 meters per second, which is gravity. So this is actually the magnitude of our acceleration. We will also prove this a little later. Question C states, what is the acceleration of the blocks after release in terms of MA and MB? To help us find acceleration, we will need to use the handy dandy Newton's second law. We'll also have to try drawing a free body diagram to better understand the situation. So blocks A and B both have gravitational force. On block A, the table or surface against block A exerts a normal force which is the force of gravity's reaction pair. Gravity wants to pull down, but normal force is like, not today. There is also tension from the string on both block A and B. Now that we have our free body diagram completed, I usually like at this point to list the known values to remind me what I can use to find the missing variable, which in our case is acceleration. We know the masses of the blocks, meaning they have been identified as MA and MB, and we also have enough information from our diagrams to calculate the net forces of both blocks. Taking a look at Newton's second law again, we now have the total masses and we can calculate the total net force if we find the net force of A and the net force of B. Although gravitational force and normal force exist on block A, these forces are not in parallel with the direction of motion. To get full points on your exam, I would highly recommend including these forces. 
but at this point our example i'll be removing these especially since they will not be affecting my net force something i should have included from the start is my orientation of motion you get to decide this so yay to having some say in these problems let's say i were to change my orientation then tension in this case would change to a negative value, but I want to change it back. Since block B's force of gravity is moving in the positive orientation, then tension at block B is negative. Awesome. So now that we have the net force of each block, we can plug these bad boys in to the acceleration formula. Friendly reminder, massless string approximation states that the tension of block A and block B are constant, meaning that they're the same all across. We can then use this for process of elimination. We are then left with force of gravity over the mass of A plus the mass of B. But remember, we are being asked to find acceleration in terms of mass A and mass B. So always double check if you can further simplify or expand depending on your perspective any further. In this case, we could. Force of gravity of block B is the same as mass B times gravity. So now, what if we tried to use this formula to answer questions A and B? Let's start with A. It states that mass A greater than mass B. So mass B is so small that we're going to consider it zero. We'll substitute zero for all the MBs. Zero over a number is just zero. And this aligns with how we initially answered A. Now let's consider question B. Here, mass A is really small. So mass A is now considered to be zero. We can then substitute this into the equation and we end up with, what do you know, G, which is our gravity or the acceleration at free fall. All right, we're almost there. Last question. Question C states, while the blocks are accelerating, the tension in the vertical portion of the string is T1, tension 1. Prove that T2 is greater than T1. For any word problem, especially longer ones, I like to briefly focus on some key words to get a better idea of what's going on. Words such as then, is, and prove. Then tells me there's a before and after. Is is telling me that something is equal to something else. And prove is a pretty bold direction. It's neither explain or guess. It's that I have to show that this statement is true. Okay, so let's start with T1 scenario. Since we used this previously, I already know A, I'm then going to want to solve for T1 since we're trying to compare T2 to T1. By multiplying by MB, and then subtracting the force of gravity, I see that I have a negative t. So then I'll multiply by negative one. These are just some basic algebra. I wanna demonstrate my algebra here because a lot of times students, including I when I took this class or other calculus classes, would make these minor errors that ended up impacting the bigger picture. So double check your algebra every single time. So here we're going to want to make sure that everything is expanded and or simplified properly so we can further expand the force of gravity. Then we end up with T1 equals to MB times gravity minus acceleration. Acceleration in this scenario. So now try solving for T2. You should get something pretty similar to T1. The only difference is our acceleration. So remember, we're trying to prove T2 is greater than T1. And we can't make that conclusion quite yet. We need to solve for these accelerations. So using Newton's second law, acceleration equals the net force over the total mass. So acceleration one, so acceleration for this scenario, it's going to include mass A, and therefore, acceleration 2 is going to include the mass of the pulley, which is no longer negligible. So here's another algebra review. Fractions can be confusing. At least they were for me. So I like to use arbitrary numbers to help me understand the behavior of fractions or even functions. 
the denominator in A2 is going to be larger than the denominator in A1 since we have an additional mass from the pulley. So I'll usually take it a step further. I'll actually use real numbers. For example, here I'm going to use 1 for the smaller number and a number bigger than 1 is 2. Anything over 1 is a whole number. But when you cut it in half, it becomes smaller. So fractions actually become smaller when the denominator becomes larger. Therefore, A1 is actually larger than A2. So understanding that, we can now plug in this information into our tension equations. I'm going to use the similar idea of using arbitrary numbers to better understand the situation. As we know, g is gravity, which is 9.8 meters per second, but I'm going to round it up to 10. All I need are numbers indicating that a1 is larger than a2, so I'm just choosing 4 and 2. If I try to actually solve this, keeping mb as just mb, we can see that tension 2 turns out to be larger than tension 1, and therefore we have proven that T2 is greater than T1. I know that might have been a lot, but we are finally done. I hope you found this helpful. Make sure to get some good rest before your exam. Question of the day. I know other types of exams and summer classes are coming up. So what topics or classes would you want to review next? Good luck studying, stay curious, be sure to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.